Gracias, eh, gracias en nombre del Faro y en nombre de todo el equipo que hace posible el Foro Centroamericano de Periodismo por estar aquí para la inauguración de Parece Mentira, nuestra séptima edición. Este trata de ser un, un encuentro no solo de periodistas, sino sobre todo un encuentro de ideas. Eh, un encuentro para la reflexión, para la discusión, para la formación eh, de ciudadanía. Eh, y eso hace que me alegre especialmente, o que me alegre más todavía, de los enormes apoyos que hemos tenido un año más, que tenemos, de hecho, cada año más, para hacer realidad esta pequeña locura que sobrepasa siempre el tamaño del Faro, que es un periódico pequeño y que es un enorme foro. Eh, gracias a todos los medios aliados, que cada vez son más los que nos apoyan en la región, eh, en El Salvador, en Guatemala, en Nicaragua, en Honduras. Eh, gracias, evidentemente, también a las organizaciones que nos ayudan con su financiamiento, eh, a las agencias de cooperación, a las empresas que patrocinan este foro y sobre todo a los colectivos de periodistas, a las universidades, pero sobre todo además a los excavadores y excavadoras que eh, apoyáis al Faro durante todo el año y que sé que muchos estáis aquí y que vais a estar acompañándonos durante todo el foro. Este año eh, hemos querido que de una manera bastante evidente hubiera un eje que atravesara todo, toda la agenda del Foro Centroamericano de Periodismo y es la conmemoración de los 25 años de los Acuerdos de Paz del de Salvador. Pero con una mirada que va muchísimo más allá o queremos que vaya mucho más allá de los actos protocolarios y de la recuperación de la simbología del pasado. Sobre todo lo que nos parece importante como periódico es que como, como sociedad, y esto creo que además va más allá de las fronteras del Salvador, porque los acuerdos del Salvador fueron importantes no solo para nuestro país, fueron importantes para la región y fueron importantes internacionalmente como referente de un modelo, como primer modelo de, de experimentación de la búsqueda de solución a conflictos por la vía dialogada que ha ido evolucionando, un modelo que ha ido evolucionando y que, y que se ha ido, evidentemente, quiero pensar, eh, perfeccionando, eh, pero sobre todo desde El Salvador queremos que, se, quere, queremos que eh, todo el año, pero que además este foro sea un balance de 25 años, que sea un espacio para discutir sobre qué hemos hecho con esos acuerdos, eh, qué hemos hecho como sociedad, ser autocríticos, en qué hemos fallado, qué tenemos que corregir y cómo podemos replantearnos el rumbo para pensar en los próximos 25, tal vez. Para eso hemos organizado toda una serie de conferencias en universidades, eh, mesas que se salen de los temas que habitualmente trata el periódico, como por ejemplo la esperanza, un elemento central en la construcción de cualquier sociedad, o un acercamiento, por ejemplo, también a los más recientes acuerdos dialogados del continente, los, los acuerdos de, de paz en Colombia. Eh, pero en mitad del de arranque de este foro, que queremos, insisto, que sea de reflexión, de discusión, de construcción, de ilusión, eh, una noticia brutal nos ha atravesado y ha sido el asesinato hoy a mediodía en Culiacán del periodista mexicano Javier Valdés. Javier Valdés, fundador de Río 12, es, era amigo de muchos de los periodistas que ya están en San Salvador y que van a estar durante el, toda esta semana en el foro. Era colega de La Jornada, eh, de Blanche Petrix en, en La Jornada, era de Sinaloa, como de Daniel Lizárraga, y era sobre todo un periodista de investigación que luchaba contra el silencio. Eh, los que han circulado durante las últimas horas en redes sociales eh, alguien recuperaba un, un tuit, una cápsula una idea encapsulada de Javier 
cuando asesinaron el pasado marzo a otra periodista mexicana, a Miroslava Brits. Y él tuiteó, a Miroslava la mataron por lengua larga. Que nos maten a todos, si esa es la condena de muerte por reportear este infierno. No al silencio. Como compartimos... Como compartimos ese no al silencio y en comunicación con grandes amigos que están haciendo periodismo en México, queremos eh, dedicar unas palabras de esta inauguración a, a Javier Valdés eh, y al mensaje y a la memoria de los periodistas que están luchando ahora mismo en México contra la censura que, intent que intenta imponer la violencia. Carlos. Daniel, no sé dónde estás, no te veo, no sé si te nos unirías también aquí en el escenario. No sé si ha llegado Daniel Sarra. Buenas noches. Sí, eh, ha sido un día difícil para nosotros, para mi querida Blanche también. Hoy, hoy debería ser un día de festejo para nosotros. Eh, de festejo por nuestro aniversario, por nuestro cumpleaños en el foro, de festejo por poder compartir con ustedes, de festejo por poderles traer un conversatorio como el que tendremos más noche, que será un privilegio. Hoy debería ser un día de festejo, pero, pero nos han vuelto a golpear. Nos mataron a Javier Valdés, nos mataron al Malayerba, el que nos dijo que nunca iba a morir porque ya había aprendido a sortear la muerte. Nos lo mataron. Es el sexto en el año que nos matan en México. Porque también nos mataron a Maximino Rodríguez. También nos mataron a Cecilio Pineda. También nos mataron a Ricardo Monloy. También nos mataron a Miroslava Bridge. También nos mataron a Filiberto Álvarez. Nos los mataron a nosotros, a los periodistas de toda América Latina. Que sepan sus asesinos los gatilleros, los narcotraficantes, los corruptos, los negligentes y sus cómplices que arropan la impunidad, que solo han hecho crecer su dignidad, su obra y su memoria, que esas no se van, que si hoy tenemos tristeza y rabia, esta tampoco desaparecerá mañana, que detrás de ellos quedamos nosotros y que detrás vienen más. Hoy queremos abrazarnos con todos nuestros colegas mexicanos, Decirle desde aquí, desde San Salvador, que somos la misma familia dolorida, que nos alcanza también su sombra, que queremos construir con ustedes la trinchera y el refugio contra esos asesinos, que no están solos porque estamos. Dijo Javier Valdés, el buen periodismo valiente, digno, responsable, honesto, no tiene sociedad alrededor, está solo. Y eso habla también de nuestra fragilidad, dijo, porque significa que si van contra nosotros o contra otros periodistas y les hacen daño, no va a pasar nada. Ya basta, ya basta. Mañana comenzaremos a redactar la declaración de San Salvador para que se unan con su firma los cientos de periodistas que nos encontramos aquí esta semana y quienes se quieran unir también desde el exterior. Que desde aquí salga un mensaje sin ambajes hacia México que desde aquí se escuche la voz del periodismo latinoamericano diciendo basta, ya basta. Para manifestar nuestra indignación por el asesinato de nuestro colega Javier Valdés, abatido por sicarios en la ciudad de Culiacán, Sinaloa, hoy 15 de mayo de 2017, y también de los otros 126 periodistas mexicanos asesinados desde el año 2000. Sus asesinos han atentado contra el derecho a información de toda la sociedad mexicana. La libertad de prensa ha sido coartada. El periodismo es una actividad fundamental en toda, sociedad, en toda sociedad funcional, pero en México el ejercicio periodístico es hoy un oficio prácticamente imposible de ejercer. 126 periodistas asesinados desde el año 2000 en México. Javier Valdés ha sido el último. 
entre los grandes enemigos del periodismo mexicano, además de los grupos del crimen organizado, de los narcotraficantes y de esas autoridades corruptas, está también el sistema judicial mexicano. Los niveles de impunidad en los casos de periodistas asesinados ascienden al 98% de los casos. Hoy, que una vez más el presidente de México, Enrique Peña Nieto, ha expresado sus condolencias a los familiares y compañeros del último periodista asesinado, le recordamos a él que la debida investigación de estos crímenes es mucho más efectivo para proteger periodistas. Y le vamos a exigir al gobierno mexicano que preside Enrique Peña Nieto una investigación pronta, debida y eficiente del asesinato de Javier Valdés y de los demás periodistas. Vamos a leer la declaración de San Salvador al final de esta semana, cuando la tengamos lista y cuando hayamos recolectado las firmas. Hoy solo les pido que nos unamos en un aplauso para Javier y que sirva también de abrazo para nuestros colegas mexicanos. La libertad de expresión es una de las, uno de los legados, si quieres, Lance, yo voy a hablar solo un minuto y arrancamos, uno de los legados, ya no te bajes, es uno de los legados que nos dejaron los acuerdos de paz eh, en El Salvador. No hay mayor celebración que ejercerla, no hay mayor desafío y mayor homenaje a los periodistas asesinados que ejercerla. Hoy vamos a hablar de un tema de unos hechos, de una verdad que se trató de acallar, que se acalló en El Salvador y que se intentó acallar también fuera. Hoy vamos a hablar de la masacre del Mosote y vamos a hablar con dos periodistas que han luchado durante muchos años por construir y han construido carreras que a nosotros en El Faro nos sirven como referencia. Blanche, gracias por estar acá. Gracias por dialogar hoy con Raymond Bonner. Por favor, Raymond, gracias. adelante. Blanche Petrick, fundadora de La Jornada, es una de las periodistas que antes de que muchos otros llegaran ya había recorrido y trabajado contando buena parte de los conflictos centroamericanos. Ha trabajado incansablemente, eh, no solo en Centroamérica, en el resto del continente y desde luego en México. Y es, ya lo decía antes, una de las periodistas más admiradas y más queridas por toda nuestra redacción, con lo cual es una alegría tenerla acá y gracias por aceptar. Raymond Bonner, eh, ha tenido también una carrera prolongadísima por, lo decía antes, que por medio mundo. Decía que ya no recuerda el español que aprendió a principios de los 80 en El Salvador pero que no está seguro tampoco de recordar bien el inglés porque ha pasado por medio planeta y se ha dejado contagiar por múltiples idiomas. Eh, contó para New Yorker simultáneamente con Alma y Guillermo Prieto, que lo hizo para The Washington Post, la masacre del Mosote. Esa masacre que en El Salvador no se quiso contar y que aún hoy, aún hoy literalmente, hay quien niega. Eh, la memoria y la recuperación de la memoria y el grito de la memoria cuando trata de ser negada es otra forma de combatir el silencio. Por eso nos parece, como siempre, en el faro tan importante tener este tema en nuestra inauguración. Gracias, Ray. Gracias, Blanche, por aceptar. Y os dejo el escenario y todo el tiempo. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Ray. Hello. Muchas gracias. Yo solamente quería eh, también expresar algo respecto a este momento extraordinariamente duro que, que ha sido, que ha marcado el día de hoy. Y, eh, yo siento que hay un simbolismo muy fuerte que yo me haya enterado, y perdón por personalizar esto, que me haya llegado esta noticia. Estoy en el eh, como 
grupo de periodistas, colectivo de periodistas, primero el uno más uno y después de la jornada, eh, periodismo crítico independiente en México, intentamos estar desde la primera hora cubriendo los hechos de la guerra aquí en El Salvador. Y fue precisamente un corresponsal nuestro en, el, en ese entonces del uno más uno, un mexicano, un chihuahuense, llamado Ignacio Rodríguez Terrazas, el primer periodista extranjero muerto, asesinado en San Salvador en 1980. También en su memoria van estas palabras. Eh, no hace ni dos meses que mataron a otra corresponsal de la jornada en Chihuahua, Miroslava Briche. En el lapso de dos meses, para un periódico como La Jornada, que intenta al mismo tiempo contar lo que pasa y rescatar la memoria, la pérdida de dos de sus mejores periodistas es un golpe inanerrable y yo estoy muy agradecida porque me he sentido muy arropada por mis queridos colegas y amigos salvadoreños. Muchísimas gracias, Carla. Y estamos hablando del de periodismo que se hace en un contexto de guerra y eh, nosotros los reporteros muchas veces no nos percatamos en el momento en que estamos trabajando de que en ocasiones nuestros reportajes, nuestras notas que mandamos en una situación límite, en condiciones difíciles, de mucha prisa, pueden convertirse en un testimonio histórico, en un documento de valor histórico que perdura a través de los años y de las décadas, aun cuando se intenten ocultar y esconder los hechos, siempre salen a la superficie. Me estaban explicando un poquito el contexto, cómo para muchas generaciones de salvadoreños la masacre del Mozote no se conoció en su momento, sino hasta después de la firma de los acuerdos de paz, cuando salió el informe de la Comisión de la Verdad documentando lo que había pasado. O quizás un poco antes, cuando se conoció el trabajo del equipo de antropólogos argentinos, equipo de antropólogos argentinos forenses, que, que sacó a la luz y que empezó a documentar de una manera científica lo que ahí había ocurrido. Sin embargo, para los periodistas de aquella generación, de aquellos tiempos, que estábamos interesados en el curso de las cosas en El Salvador y que empezábamos también a cubrir este conflicto, tuvimos eh, la versión de primera mano en las notas de Raymond Bonner en el New York Times, la versión de Alma Guillermo Prieto en el Washington Post, las extraordinarias y dolorosas fotografías de sus hermanos. Por eso yo le decía a Raymond, yo no lo conocía sino hasta hoy, pero en aquellos años él fue mi héroe, porque contó justamente lo que no se estaba contando, un hecho tan grave y que quizás hoy en día siga siendo una masacre que no ha sido superada en dimensiones, a pesar de lo sangrienta que ha sido la historia reciente de nuestros países en América Latina. Eh, yo les decía, el trabajo de Ray fue un documento, es hoy en día un documento histórico. Y si les parece, voy a plantearles las preguntas en inglés, quizás para facilitar un poquito el diálogo, aprovechando de que tienen interpretación simultánea. Uh, but when you arrived to El Salvador, in, you decided to go to El Mozote to find out what was happening. You've heard rumors and some versions about a massacre. By then, you didn't imagine that your work, the story you were about to write, was going to be something with a, such an historical importance. What were you thinking when you went to El Mozote, and how did you get there? Thank you, and first, my apologies for not speaking Spanish, it's been four years and I want to remember like 35. And 
Since then, I've been all around the world, Poland, Indonesia, Eastern Europe, you name it, and I'm afraid I've lost. I'm not even sure my English is that good anymore. And before we start, I'd like to say a word about our colleague, Javier. This is happening all too often. And those of you who are journalists or want to be journalists, I encourage you to use a moment like this to rededicate yourselves to the work that you do. And I remember it was about 10 days ago at Columbia University where I do some teaching journalism school. A Mexican student in the class, there were three women who spoke on International Press Day and they spoke for three minutes and a Mexican student spoke about all of her friends and colleagues who had been killed. She said this made her more than ever want to go back in me to Mexico and work as a journalist in memory of her friends and colleagues who had been killed. And in a moment like this, I would urge you to rededicate yourselves in the memory of Javier. As for when I went into El Mesote, <clears throat> I was a young journalist. I wasn't young, but I was young as a journalist. It was, um, I'd been in covering El Salvador for about two years. I'd been a lawyer and then dropped out of being a lawyer and became a journalist. And as it was, I arrived in El Salvador on a Sunday. The nuns were killed on Tuesday, and the rest, as they say, is history. I started writing for the New York Times. And I was in and out of El Salvador. And then, you know, I, it's a long time ago. You know, we're talking 30 plus years. I don't think I had heard rumors of the massacre. I think what it was, look, this was the biggest story of the time. Biggest American foreign policy story. For those of you who are, weren't even born at that time, many of you probably, and it's hard to imagine Central America was the foreign policy issue. As big as Syria and Iraq and the Middle East are today, this was the hot spot of American foreign policy. We were pouring more money into El Salvador than other, something like two or three other countries, more than India, more than Egypt, or third after India and Egypt. The American embassy was bigger than the embassy in New Delhi. And if you're going to cover that story, we, every journalist here wanted to go in with the guerrillas, wanted to go in with the FMLN. I, I, was, I was later criticized by a lot of people, starting with the Wall Street Journal, for writing about this. But how could you be a journalist and not want to cover the other side of the story, as it were? Now, let me tell you, it was a lot different than, than it is today. Today, you can't go in and write about ISIS for obvious reasons, and it's much more dangerous than it was then. So I wanted to go in, and I think every journalist did. We all made it known. Chris Dickey of the Washington Post, Alma Guillermo Prieto, we all, Susan Micellis, every British journalist from Le Monde, the French journalist, you name it, The Guardian, <clears throat> we all wanted to go in. And, you know, we were based here in San Salvador when it was much smaller than it is now. I'd get lost. I mean, there was like one hotel, the Camino Real. And so when I say we wanted to go in, we wanted to see the other side. I mean, we could go out for a day, drive back, write our stories, but we really wanted to travel with the guerrillas, as it were, the FMLN. And I was back in New York, and this part is where I get... Fuzzy, I had dinner with Susan Micellis not long ago and with Alma as well. We were trying to remember, but it was over Christmas and I got a call basically saying, well, it's ready if you want to go. Of course. And, um, but I, I know it had, later I heard that it had been reported on Radio Vence Ramos about the massacre, but I don't recall that at the time I remember that. I was going to go in. So <clears throat> Susan and I... Susan Micellis, photographer, 
the great photographer, we went to Tegucigalpa, and the word was, we'd go to Tegucigalpa, somebody would meet us, you know, there were all these maneuverings that had to be done. And we drove up the road, and somebody else would meet us, and then we'd go in. And the first night we went up, there was some hitch. You know, these were the days before cell phones. And so we went back to the hotel, and then we did it the next night. And then we were met on the road, hopped out of the car with our backpacks. And these were heavy backpacks, nothing like you kids have today, let me tell you. <laughs> I, tell, I tell students, you're not going to believe this. Let me digress for a minute. I told her all she had to do was push a button and I'd talk. She didn't have to worry about asking a lot of questions. <laughs> we did not have day packs. You know those things just common for you? I had what was called a Danish schoolboy school bag, which I bought at a place on the east side of New York. I had one strap. In there I had a tape recorder, a camera, and a typewriter. But when we went in, we had a little bit more. We had backpacks of sorts. We got out of the car. We got to this river, took Ford the river, packs over our head, and it was a full moon. I'm thinking two things. One, I'm thinking, yeah, this is kind of romantic. It kind, of, <laughs> kind of reminds me of backpacking in when I was in Northern California in the Sierra Nevada. And then there was the other part of me. I happened to have been in the Marines in Vietnam. I happened to be in the Marines with one Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, for those of you who may be old enough to remember <clears throat> what his role was in Nicaragua. And I'm thinking, you know, this is pretty dangerous. If there are snipers up in those hills, mm -hmm. this is not really a very wise thing. <laughs> anyway, we went in, and then I don't, remember, I don't remember the sequence, how many days we were in before we actually got taken to Masote. So sorry, that's a long wind-up. Well, uh, allow me to say something. Uh, as a Mexican journalist, w we didn't see it as an exclusive part of the Cold War, as the Eastern-Western conflict. And something I notice is that you don't either. I, I, I can't read that bias in your story about El Mosote. Did you have that bias? Uh, how did you perceive what was going on in El Salvador by the time? Why did the United States engage so heavily in, in such a small country only six years after their defeat in Vietnam? Perceived it quite clearly once um, Ronald Reagan was elected president. I mean, they said it. <clears throat> Literally, this is where we're going to draw the line in the sand against the spread of communism. As the American government at the time saw it, this was a beachhead for Moscow via Havana into Central America. As Robert White, the great late Robert White, who was the ambassador in the Carter administration, put it, deriding the policy, they're worried about, the in Washington, they're worried about the communists are coming. First Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, all the way to the soft underbelly of Kansas. That was the way, you know, he, but that's the way it was perceived. This was, this was the forefront of the fight against communism. Maybe hard to perceive, it is hard to understand today. And even later on in the Reagan administration, and I can't remember whether it was Jim Baker or Joel, George Saltz said, what are we doing down there? What, what, what's this all about? And they slowly began to withdraw. But, you know, as a journalist, <clears throat> I'm not a reporter for the American government. I'm not a reporter against the American government. We're not, we're not Pravda, we're not an arm of the government. It's because I, I remember the way you phrased it. You, you said, you mentioned the leftist guerrillas. Uh, other journalists uh, from American media would say the Soviet-backed guerrillas or 
Cuban back guerrillas or communist guerrillas. I, there, there is like slight bias or a slight detail in the way you, you word it. Sure, I mean, I... I, 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 I guess there is a, a meaning, there is a reason in your political formation or the way you were looking at things at the time. I don't remember. I mean, I could put that in a more contemporaneous context if you want, if you will. But, and then I'll come back to it. I mean, I think you have to be careful of labels. Are they guerrillas? I mean, I can remember, the, you know, again, you're dredging up things from the past. Do you call them revolutionaries? Do you call them guerrillas? Insurgents? When does it become a civil war? Subversives. Huh? Subversives. Subversives. Um, you know, the labels make a difference. Sometimes they say something. It's always dangerous. Is it a right-wing government? Is it, is it a, a leftist government? You have to be careful. I, I tell you, it's been much more prevalent post-9-11 when talking about Al-Qaeda. I was in in uh, Indonesia after 9-11 for about five, six years. And any time there'd be a terrorist attack, and there were several in Indonesia and elsewhere, they'd write Abu Sayyaf, which was one of the groups, comma, linked to Al-Qaeda, comma. You know, journalists did this because that was a way to get their stories prominence in the paper. It drove me crazy. Because what does link to Al-Qaeda mean? That they danced arm in arm with Osama bin Laden? That they pledged allegiance? And it's the same thing back, back then. I mean, these are charged. With, yes, the Soviet probably put in arms and put in some support of some kind. Yes, Cuba did. But you have to be very, very, very careful with labels. I mean, I saw it, I probably saw it, <clears throat> I saw it as a, I saw it, I think, as Bob White saw it, um, in, in an amazing telegram that Ambassador White sent to Washington, and unfortunately, it wasn't declassified until many, many, many years later. It's about 34 pages long, and I would urge you if you want to understand what was going on in El Salvador back then, to read it. He said, there'd be a revolution here even if there weren't for Cuba. The rich for too long, backed by the military, and the poor have been kept poor. And there would be a revolution even without Cuba. You're right. You, you, you go beyond labels and... Uh, going back to the uh, pure journalist work, you were able just to go there, listen to the survivors, uh, see the scene, report the facts, and write your story only based in that. Uh, and then after that, after the story was published, uh, U.S. officials and Salvadorian officials said it was not true. So there, there is a conflict also in, in the narratives. What narrative is right and which is wrong? How do journalists um, go through this? And, um, a ver, lo voy a decir en español, ¿cómo hacen valer la verdad de un trabajo honesto como el, el tuyo? Sorry, I... No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, I don't... I mean, I thought about this a lot, and I've talked about it a lot with journalism students and others in the forums. I saw the bodies. I saw El Masote. And I talked to survivors. Now, did I know for sure what happened? No, of course not. I wasn't there. And for those of you who may be lawyers and know something about the American legal system, or the you know, British legal system, we have something called 
to convict somebody, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And I, I, what I talk about is beyond a journalistic doubt. Do you believe something beyond a journalistic doubt, and then you write it? And all I did was write what I saw and what people told me. And we put in the story that somebody who wasn't there couldn't say for sure what happened. But the American government and the critics of our reporting said, you know, I mean, the Wall Street Journal ran an editorial damning me. And for those of you who read the Wall Street Journal, as I do, by the way, every day, the Wall Street Journal usually has two or three editorials. But when they went after me, they, d they left the whole editorial so they could attack me for my reporting about the El Masote massacre. And they wrote a reporter out on a limb. And by the way, journalistically, to digress for a moment for you journalists here, Alma Guillermo Prieto, who was the Washington Post reporter, was only there because I actually called her. When I got my invitation to go in, I said, Alma, I'm going in. And she quickly arranged to go in as well. Now, many journalists would tell you, my God, you shared this opportunity with a competitor? Yeah, and by God, am I glad I did, because that meant both the New York Times and the Washington Post had the story on its front page. Do you consider there was uh, enough follow-up stories about El Mozote? or it, it disappeared quickly after? Oh, I don't, I don't remember at the time that it disappeared quickly. I mean, it was a pretty hot issue for a while. I don't remember when it disappeared. And then it, <clears throat> it resurrected again when the, the documents were declassified and released in the early 1900s after the Peace Commission. And Did you feel at the moment it was like a vindication of what you've written? No, Blanche, I've been asked that a lot. Vindication. It's not something I think about. Look. You do the kind of reporting that I do. You do investigative reporting. You do some hard-hitting reporting, and it's, you got to take your lumps. You know, I didn't particularly run around saying I'm vindicated, I'm vindicated. I had moved on by then, was writing, my gosh, by then I'd already been in Africa and was probably about to go to Eastern Europe. You know, I think for, I remember saying that once at a conference, <clears throat> asked the same question, do you feel vindicated? Gave a similar answer. And a reporter in the back said, well, it may not have meant that much for you, but it means a lot for other investigative reporters. It means if you do write honestly and truthfully, that eventually you know, the truth will come out and you will be vindicated. And then um, after the story was out, there was no uh, justice. I mean, nobody was held responsible. Nobody was taken to court. Um, did you think at the time, what's the use for journalists to do their work if there are no consequences for perpetrators in cases like that? No, you never think. I mean, you always wonder, does it make a difference as a journalist? You always wonder that. You write all this. I mean, look at the world today. Look what's happening in Syria. Look at the refugees. After El Salvador, I was in Rwanda during the genocide. Bosnia. Other places, Kurdistan. You, know, you don't. 
I don't think any of us as journalists are ever satisfied that we've done enough or made a difference, but asking a doctor once why she did what she did in a rural area of Bolivia. She says, because I couldn't do anything else. You do it, you write about it, keep going because you can't do anything else. Except follow-up stories. Maybe. Except for keeping writing stories. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing about journalism. Yeah. You write a story, you work hard, you go to bed, you get up the next morning, you got another one waiting for you. Privileged profession. Yeah, maybe the, the style in Latin American journalism is a bit different from that. You've got some very good Latin American journalists. I mean, you look at the very correct. I mean, and I, this isn't a plug because they're sponsoring this. I mean, look at El Faro. Look at the work they do. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Hard-hitting journalism. And there's others like it in other parts of the continent. I'm not as familiar with it anymore. But there are groups in Peru, I know, and John Dingus, is, who you all know, of course, goes around Latin America. There's good work. There's good work in Mexico. Great work. I mean, they're not killing journalists because they're not having an impact, sadly. They're killing them because they don't like what they're writing. Raymond, did you go back to El Mozote afterwards? <clears throat> I went back once. Um, and that was because when the documents came out, Proved that there had How been many a, years later? I'm sorry? How many years later? I think it was 94. I think it was after the Peace Commission. And the Peace Commission got a lot of documents given to them by the American government for the purposes of the Peace Commission. And the several members of Congress said, wait a minute, if you've given these documents to um, the Peace Commission, we want to see them as well. And the Clinton administration early on, when it came in, so it would have been 92 or 93, declassified a lot of documents. And so then, then um, 60 Minutes decided to do a piece and brought me and Susan Micellis back wasn't the same. After the, the story came out uh, in the States, you, you were hardly criticized by some media, by some officials. And by the American ambassador here. Uh, exactly. And, and soon after you were removed from El Salvador's post, would you mind commenting about that? <laughs> What happened, really? She, she, yeah. <laughs> it was your editor's She, she decision. warned me she was going to ask this. Not, <laughs> not that I'm surprised. Um, it's, it, look, it's, it's much more complicated than that. At the time, the New York Times didn't have a bureau in Central America. And so I was just coming and going. At the same time, there's no question that... Uh, in those times, and in those times, small t and capital T, you know, my reporting wasn't viewed very favorably. I was considered by many as being, well, I mean, I was called a communist by many people, and if, when they couldn't make that stick, because I read the stock market every day, and they decided, well, they're not a very good Marxist, they decided to call me an adversary journalist, an advocacy journalist. And um, the New York Times, I was in Nicaragua actually when I got the call saying, we want you to come back. <laughs> Basically said, the editor who called me said, you better hurry before it gets worse. So that, you know, it wasn't, it, somebody just wrote on, there's a New York Times alumni website on Facebook 
and some, somebody just wrote, actually today I just read it, about an incident in the 1980s when the then executive editor of the New York Times it was very clear he thought who was the guy that was executive editor when I was either pushed or jumped um, thought the paper was moving too far to the left was too liberal thought we were all a bunch of liberal we were about to deliver Central America to the communists so you know it wasn't I don't think many people would think it was the New York Times best moment well <laughs> some people think it was <laughs> no but I mean when they recalled me they don't think it was their best moment <laughs> yeah but uh, you know it goes with the territory still um, uh, as we said before uh, your story and the Alma's story about El Mozote is a very important document for understanding El Salvador's history. It happened 35 years ago, and it's a case that, whether it's very well known or not, it's still alive. Uh, as we learned uh, when the Supreme Court here in El Salvador abolished the amnesty law that protected perpetrators during the war, uh, the case was reopened. What does that mean to you? Well, I mean, I always like to see justice done. I think it's good you can run, but you can't hide. And I think it's good that groups like CPJ in California, you know, the committee... Um, Center for, no, I've lost the name of it, uh, just CJA, Center for Justice and Accountability. Uh, they've pursued a lot of these cases. They're pursuing the cases of the killing of the Jesuit priests. Um, and uh, I think it's good. I think the International Criminal Court in The Hague is something that is good, very good, and I'm sad that the United States doesn't give it more support. But if you can bring justice to people who were involved in, in, you know, in El Masote, and then Archbishop Romero's assassination, as well as assassination, the killing of tens of thousands of Salvadorans, that's a message. It's not revenge. It's a message can't do this with impunity, like they're doing in Mexico today. They're killing journalists with impunity. And people have to be held accountable. Um, we were told a few moments ago how um, this story of El Mozote is not fully understood by Salvadorian society, and there is still a denial that actually a massacre happened happened there. Uh, what do you think it's needed to uh, validate all the data, all the information that came out first with your story and later on with all the documents, the work of the forensic anthropologists, all, all the facts that are there in the archives and in the press and elsewhere? Anybody who still denies that there was a massacre in El Masote, there is no amount of evidence that you can show him or her if they're not convinced now that it's going to change it. Some people, no matter what happens, will continue to deny. I mean, you know, the earth is flat. It was a massacre. It was committed by... Salvadoran government forces, which were backed by the United States, not at that particular moment, saying the United States had a role in the massacre. Even American officials who were in power at the time and denied it at the time have admitted it, have acknowledged it. So, I mean, it's... it's 
But, uh, yes, but uh, the, the story, the actual story of El Mozote has still to struggle to, to come, to get out in the light and to be fully understood. What happens if it doesn't, if it, this doesn't happen? For instance, uh, for young journalists, there is also uh, un reto, uh, like a, reto? a challenge. How do they revisit this story? How do they report on that? How do they invest, do research and journalism uh, on El Mozote's history and El Mozote's silence? Right, on what happened there? young American journalist here right now who's doing that. Uh, very, very good journalist. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I, <clears throat> you've got the documents now. You, that's the starting point. You go, you interview as many people as possible. I would think by now there's probably some of the soldiers. I mean, if I were a journalist and revisiting the story, I'd probably try, I, I don't know what's happened, so maybe some of this has happened, but I'd probably try to find some of the soldiers that were, that were um, part of that operation. I think journalistically, now that you made me think about it, you know, and I, as I say, I do some teaching, that's what I'd do. I'd try to find some of the soldiers. Some of them now, what, what, what they must, they're, you know, and they're in their late 40s, 50s. Interesting. And if you want a journalism lesson, you call every one of them. It's a journalist. It's a story that came out a couple of years ago on 60 Minutes, totally unrelated to this. The journalist, the reporter, called 80 people. The story that just came out now, I don't know if you followed it about Bill O'Reilly and the problems he's had was broken by a New York Times reporter. I don't know how many people she called. So if I were giving, if I were teaching a journalism class, I'd say, yeah, you get all the members of the Atlacoddle Battalion who were involved in that operation, and you start calling them. And you go visit them. You get one of them to give you a That's first That's what investi investigative reporting means. Yeah. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah. Be a great story. And you'll find one or more that will talk. Well, maybe I think in the audience there are also some questions. We can open the mic to. Si abrimos la, las preguntas, si alguien del foro desea participar. Veo muchísimas manos que se levantan. <risa> eh, buenas noches, mi nombre es Mónica y soy periodista cubana. No veo, no veo dónde, dónde. Ah, disculpe. <risa> Aquí. Ok. Eh, la pregunta que yo tengo va más bien sobre el proceso editorial que vivió eh, durante la investigación de la historia, luego durante la escritura y posteriormente durante la edición. No sé si a lo mejor me pedí algo en, en la exposición, pero me interesaría que profundizara en cómo fue editorialmente el proceso de discusión de la historia y si se realizó fact-checking y cómo se realizó. I didn't understand. So sorry. Okay, yeah, she wants to know how was the process uh, of the construction of the story, the reporting, the writing process, and also the editing process with the editors back in New York, uh, how the decisions were made and uh, the fact-checking process es on, por ahí, ¿verdad? Sí, en el Mesote o en general. El Mesote. Mm -hmm. 
El mesote, well. <laughs> no, contrary to what you think, the New York Times ran every story I wrote. So any belief that the New York Times censored me or wouldn't run stories, it's not true. That particular story, that particular story, um, I mean, as I say, I went in, and then, you know, I took notes, I had notebooks full, um, and, and then <laughs> Alma came in on, on, uh, on a donkey or one, I can't remember, but she came in after me, and when she, uh, she knew I was going to leave before her, she wrote hers, she wrote hers on small pieces of paper and sent it out with somebody who then called the Washington Post. I went back to, as I recall, I went back to Mexico City after I got out and um, stayed in Mexico City and wrote the stories. And I think I wrote four stories, and one of them was the El Mesote Massacre. And I don't remember the particular editing on that story. All I do remember is they inserted that line. Somebody who, was there, who wasn't there can't, you know, can't say exactly what happened. But there, there, there was no... That, that really, the, the, there was no censorship on that story or very many stories. The stories that upset them more <clears throat> were, was when I wrote about the election, which they had here, and there were a lot of questions if, if really that, as many people voted as said they voted. And when I wrote those stories, uh, those, those created more problems almost than El Masote did. But El Masote was a problem, as had been the killing of the nuns. I think since the killing of the American church women, uh, the, probably after that, the killing of the American church women changed the attitudes in America about the, the war in El Salvador. It had a really, really, really huge impact, which, which doesn't necessarily speak well. Because 10,000 Salvadorans had been killed that year. But it wasn't until they killed the American church women that people in the United States and in Washington began to pay attention. And then I think, I mean, you know, you had 10 years of civil war. But it took an El Masote or killing of the nuns or the killing of the Jesuits you know, many years later before America really paid attention. And Americans and journalists. Sí. Well, I guess um, my question is more about you as a person rather than a journalist. What, I, what are the effects that seeing all of these different things, not just El Mosote, but rather, you know, the Ronda killings and other places you've been that are war-torn and have had on you as a person? What's the question? <laughs> well, I guess if you want to narrow it down, just in general, um, how did you feel after you saw the terror that got out of the Mesote? Look. Part of me wants to say, part of me says, the note, there's the notebook between you and what you're seeing. I mean, I did, I mean, I can still see some of the bodies that I saw at El Masote. One, one image particular of a man in, you know, a hut that it had been collapsed and you know, burned and the, the beams had come down. There were coffee beans spilled near his head where he was lying. I, Rwanda is in many ways even more traumatic, but you know, let's, not, let's not put them on a scale. I was in Kurdistan with the same forensic people who eventually 
went to El Mesote, the same group from Argentina and Oklahoma. But I, that didn't answer your question, but I'll tell you one thing that, look, I find this very uncomfortable talking about personal things. I can talk about being a journalist, but, but I will say one thing, that whenever I've gone to these places, Salvador, I mean, Kurdistan, Rwanda, Srebrenica, Bali. I keep hearing the words of Archbishop Romero. In the name of God, stop the repression. I believe uh, this question le leads to some, something that we journalists face uh, from time to time uh, when, when you report on very hard things. You have to put your feelings aside and just do your work. And this is how, this is how things are done. There is no other way, no? Isn't it? <laughs> okay, another question. Otra pregunta por ahí. Es que no veo bien. Um, uh, hello. I have, I have a question on the topic of alternative facts. You know, because <laughs> alternative facts are not new. And in those days, alternative facts actually where some of the journalists that were the ones who went to the field and saw what was happening. But the, the institutional trend was to hide, to hide, to hide everything and say, no, that's, that's not true, he's lying. Um, but in the present, we have, we have tools, we have, we have the social media, have uh, other media and uh, we keep hearing some voices that uh, go with the flow so um, I just want to hear your uh, uh, opinion on that I mean because alternative facts have changed now. Well, what's, what's, what do you want to hear my opinion on what's the question because uh, what would you say to the journal to the people in journalism that that uh, find too hard to to go against the flow of institutional trend and uh, too hard to go against the flow as a journalist? One, if you want to be a journal, if you want to be popular, don't be a journalist. Our, our, True that. Our, our, you know, we're not out there to be liked. Yeah. And two. I got to tell you, part of me is getting a little tired of all this journalistic navel gazing about whether we're the enemy or whether we're not or blah, blah, blah. Just get on with it. Just be a journalist. It's a great job. It's a great life. It's a great opportunity. Let's go out and do our work. Look, this, this isn't new. I just saw a documentary the other night called Dateline Saigon. I mean, you're all way too young to remember this, most of you. There were four or five reporters down there at the time. This is Kennedy wanted to remove David Halberstam. Sorry, some of you don't know what this is about, but in, this, in Vietnam, President Kennedy talked to the publisher of the New York Times to remove David Halberstam from Vietnam because he didn't like he was reporting. You know, it... it, it I want to be very careful here because I don't feel comfortable saying this, but Arya Nair said it in a public panel. Arya Nair was a great human rights, started Human Rights Watch. Said this in a public panel about a month or two ago. So it's only because he said it that I'm going to say this. 
He said, Halberstam, and then what they did to me. And the government never, never likes what we do. They're always, you know, uh, but, you know, we don't do this to be popular. I have a colleague at the New York Times that says our obligation is to put on the front page of the New York Times what the government doesn't want to see there. I can't help thinking about Donald Trump and the fake news. <laughs> Every time Donald Trump <laughs> says it's a failing New York Times, his subscriptions go up. Look, don't, 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 I don't mean to make light of this. We're living in a very, very perilous times. And as I said earlier, you won't see, the, what can the United States say about what's happening to journalists in Mexico? The United States has lost the moral authority to speak about this. It's very serious. I don't, I don't, I don't mean to make light of it, but I think you know, our job, we keep doing our job and just keep doing it and don't, you know, <laughs> a little bit flip, but when, when Trump says he's going to cancel press conferences, Press briefings, daily press briefings. I mean, there's part of me that says, great. It'll make journalists have to go out and really work hard and dig, and they're not going to just take handouts from, you know, from the podium. Ray, uh, I'm just curious. In the aftermath, has, did anybody from any of your accusers from the State Department the Wall Street Journal, wherever, <laughs> ever apologized to you and acknowledged that you were right and they were wrong? No. No, they, they haven't, and, and frankly, I don't expect them to. Mm -hmm. no. I mean, not only haven't they apologized, but the Wall Street Journal, after these... Uh, articles came out the, after the 60 minute piece um, after the 60 minutes piece came out and the documents which didn't quote unquote vindicate me and did show even they, they wrote it still wrote an editorial against me saying you know we didn't fire Ray Bonner Abe Rosenthal did no I don't expect him to Sorry, just, I, to, I have... ju just to add what you were saying about Kennedy and, and David Halberstam and if there are people who want to know more about that, because it was very important, there's a very fine book called Once Upon a Distant War by William Prochnow that has a lot about Halberstam there. That'll go into that a lot more. Sorry, I have one last question. We're here. <laughs> Hi, good night. Hi. You have said you were a very young journalist by that time. I would like to know if you would have done something different if you have the opportunity nowadays. That is a very, very, very good question. And I'll tell you why. I was not young, by the way. I was actually... <laughs> <laughs> you said that. I did not become a journalist until I was older than you are, I can tell you. I had been a lawyer. Um, I, I, I didn't become a journalist until I was 40. But I was young in that I had no journalistic experience. And this is a question I've raised, and I raise it with journalism students, and I raise it with myself. Would I have reported the same way? I don't I think there's some naivete that goes with it. I mean, I, people said to me later, oh, you can say anything you want to in the New York Times. You just have to know how to say it. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute. Why do I have to figure out how to say it? Why can't I? I mean, I know this sounds terribly self-serving or something. I'm, I'm naive or, or disingenuous. I'm not. I'm serious. I thought, well, why do I have to figure out how to say it? Why can't I just write what happened? I mean, I think being inexperienced, in some ways, I, I, I didn't find myself thinking. There was no self-censorship. I didn't find myself thinking, well, I'm not sure I can write it this way because...
mean, Chris Dickey, when he reviewed my book, said that I was writing all these things, you know, knowing they would land on the congressman's, we still got newspapers, desk every morning. <laughs> I didn't know that. I was, I was just, I was just, I know this sounds disingenuous when I'm telling you <laughs> it's the truth. I was just writing what I saw and what was happening. And of course, I was, I was appalled by what was happening. I saw the American government backing, you know, the death squads, basically. I did see I mean, another image that I have that has always stayed with me. You ask what impact it has. This is an image that stayed with me. Is Christmas Day, day before Christmas, I was here, it would have been 80, 80, I guess. Music was playing in the mall. It was the only mall you had at the time, in the shopping center, across from the Camino Real. And on a wall behind the mall, there were two or three students, and in classic way, that had their thumbs tied behind their back with wire, and then been shot in the head, and left you know, right there at the mall with all the Christmas music playing. You know that that. Naturally, I was going to write that. I, you know, I think, I think, and I also tell you something else. When I started out with the New York Times, when I first wrote my first, I took a bus from Tegucigalpa to San Salvador. I didn't fly. I didn't stay. And when I stayed in the Camino Real at first, I was sleeping on somebody's floor. And I think you're better as a journalist when you start out. So would I report it any differently? I'm afraid that I might, but it wouldn't be for the, it wouldn't be better. I'm afraid I might engage in some self-censorship. Um, I know I, it was supposed to be the last question, but I, I would like to make I'll one more. I'll take as many as you want. I have, one, I have, one, I have, one, no. one more question from me. Um, I, I believe you, you agree that uh, the follow-up reporting on the El Mosote Uh, displaying uh, the real involvement of the U.S. government in, with the Salvadorian army in the cover-up of the story and in future military actions in El Salvador has not been told yet, fully told, which is something that's still pending to do. Uh, how, uh, what's missing in this story? What information is missing uh, in what we know until now about that? I don't know that a lot's missing. I mean, so, almost all the documents, I mean, there's around the fringes, maybe, I, I think the story is, I still would like to know how they inflated the numbers so highly in the, in the election, which may seem like a small thing. I mean, we know, I think we have a pretty good take on what American foreign policy was. Just to look the other way, they thought they were fighting communism. Um, Dao Bisan was a pariah by Ambassador White, and then he was welcomed back by... Everything changed, as you know. It's in, it's in, it's in the book. I'm not trying to sell the book, but I mean, it's, everything changed in December, in November 1980, after Reagan was elected. You know, there were fireworks here. People were ecstatic. And they believed that, the hand, that you know, they no longer had to worry about human rights. They thought Carter was, was too soft on human rights, cared too much about human rights, and therefore didn't support the Salvadoran government and the Salvadoran military. I, th I, think we, I, think, I think we have a pretty good picture of what went on. Whether people who should be held accountable are, are accountable, um, that's another thing. 
And that's what's missing. Hmm? And that's what's missing. Yeah, but that's not the story that needs... That's, that's not for journalists. I mean, that's, that's for... That's not the... I mean, holding people accountable. It's not for us to prosecute. Exactly. That's true. Um, concluyendo, voy a, a decirlo en español. Sí. Yo creo que lo que... Lo que hemos escuchado de Raymond Bonner eh, sobre cómo se construyó, cómo llegó él, cómo contó la historia del mozote, lo que está pendiente todavía eh, y la forma como este tema sigue vivo eh, y con una serie de tareas todavía que, que, que cumplirse es es un reto para las nuevas generaciones de periodistas. Un capítulo que no se puede cerrar así, inconcluso, que va a seguir abierto, mientras no se continúe con la investigación y pues como, como son estas historias, mientras no haya verdad y justicia, las heridas no se cierran, los temas siguen abiertos, el mozote, 35 años después, eh, sigue siendo un tema pendiente. A lo mejor estas generaciones, como la mía, la de Raymond, la muñeca, muchos otros colegas, este, ya no nos toca contarlo, pero es la tarea, el reto que tienen los nuevos periodistas, sobre todo los periodistas de El Salvador. Y El Faro nos demuestra día a día que hay ganas y hay talento y hay vocación para, para hacerlo. Bueno, pues esta sería la conclusión, agradeciendo muchísimo la oportunidad para hacer esta reflexión a los compañeros fareros. Thank you so much. Gracias, Ray. Gracias, Blanc, doblemente. Gracias a todos. Os recuerdo, antes de que salgamos a tomar unas cervezas para celebrar la inauguración del Foro Centroamericano de Periodismo, os recuerdo que mañana nos trasladamos al Marte, al Museo de Arte. A partir de las cinco y media tenemos dos mesas, una para hablar de cómo se cuenta la esperanza en una región sin esperanza, una región digamos, que es constante desafío con la esperanza. Vamos a tener a Sergio Ramírez, al escritor Emiliano Monge, a Marcela Zamora y a Karina Salguero Moya. Y después una mesa extraordinaria también con periodistas de investigación de México, de Argentina, de Brasil, para hablar de investigación, de investigación sobre corrupción, una mesa moderada por nuestra colega guatemalteca eh, Claudia Méndez Arriaza. Os espero mañana a partir de las cinco y media en el martes. Y ahora sí, vamos a tomar algo.